leave it there. I was down with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free.
that the Lord has made. Watch the command. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but this morning, the goodness of the Lord is very apparent in all that is going on. Um, if you woke up this morning, that means you got something to praise Him for. If you were in your right mind, that means you got something to praise Him for. So let's go into a word of prayer. We've got a word for you today, and I want to go right into the Word of God. Come on, let's pray with me. Father God, again, by your own sovereign will, you brought your people together to hear your voice. And as they hear from you today, God, may their lives be changed, directed, and set on a higher course so that they can find their purpose in you. Lord, I bind up any spirits that will come against your word. Lord, somebody who may be sick, I ask you to touch their body. Someone struggling, I ask you to touch them so that nothing can impede your spirit from coming into their mind. Bless them now, as I know you can and will. Lord, I decrease that you might come and preach. Let nothing I say mess up your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going into a very familiar passage of Scripture today. I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 12. We're going to read three verses into your hearing this morning from Romans chapter 12. The Magna Carta of Theology. Let's read it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you should, but remember to judge yourself soberly in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given unto you. Romans chapter three, chapter 12, three verses. We're going to speak from this thought today. Strong spiritual health leads to divine mental health. Strong spiritual health leads to divine mental health. Anyone who grew up in church like I did have had their share or understand about Christian taboos or superstitions or some of the uh, infamous do's and don'ts of church. Come on, you know, some things that were denominationally interpreted in the Bible and they were passed down generation after generation until the things that we thought we heard growing up, we thought they were in the Bible. As a matter of fact, they became Bible to us and then we found out they were not. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. The first one is this. Um, women can't wear pants in the church. I know I'm not the only one who heard that. It's a sin for a woman to wear pants in the church. Matter of fact, some denominations, some churches say makeup is even a sin. And you've heard that one. Also, when I was growing up as a child, you could not walk across the pulpit area in the church. Uh, there was something about the pulpit. I'm talking about behind where the pastor's preaching, like I'm standing. Then not walk across that sacred uh, area in danger of your life. And then one day, I remember, do not set anything on the communion table. The communion table is sacred, which puzzled me because I wondered how the deacons could pick it up every Sunday when we had, when we had communion on the first Sunday and put it somewhere. But other than that, it was sacred. I guess they had touch. And then this one is kind of laughable, but I thought it was in the Bible. Um, when it's lightning and thundering outside, you got to be quiet because God is doing his work. I remember in my house, my dad would turn off the lights. You had to sit still. And, of course, as soon as that happened, me and my brothers and sisters would get a case of the giggles. 
and so we ultimately get smacked. But here is the thing. There was one of three things would happen to you if you violated any of these sacred taboos, any of these sacred scriptures. Here's the first thing. The first thing that would happen to you, of course, is the first one, pet peeve, and that is you are in danger of going to hell if you violated those. The second thing that would happen is something bad is going to happen to you. This was very nondescript. They couldn't tell you what was going to happen to you, but something bad was going to happen to you. And the third thing that would happen to you is, watch this, God could strike you down. Don't touch that table. God's going to strike you down. And not only that, when we were growing up, there was also, you know, some biblical interpretation of Bible stories that we thought were Bible because uh, that's not how we were taught. I was taught this in Sunday school. You don't believe me? Watch this. Some of these you know. The first one is, I could have sworn I read that Eve gave Adam an apple. But the Bible doesn't say that when you go back and look. The Bible said Eve gave Adam fruit. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. But you know, you've seen it, the big picture of the, the, the devilish apple that Eve gave to Adam. Also, how about this one? Jonah was swallowed by a whale. We made that up. The Bible says nothing about a whale. The Bible said it was a great fish. And the last one is, we three kings of Orion are the three wise men. We don't know, first of all, whether it was three. I mean, we know when they got down, when the Bible talks about when they finally got there, the three gifts that they gave, you know, incense, myrrh. We know about that, frankincense. But here's the thing we need to understand is that by the time the wise men got there, they should not have been in the nativity scene. Jesus was two years old when they finally reached Jesus. Some of these things I'm talking to you about are harmless. They're laughable. And, you know, they really didn't hurt anybody. And you can, you know, you can find yourself, if you get old enough, you can read it and correct it. But there is one biblical interpretation that crosses all denominations and affects Christians and non-Christians alike. And you better listen because this is a paradoxical interpretation of the Scripture. But we've all heard of it. It's paradoxical because in one sense it breeds fear and uh, anguish and helplessness. But on the other sense, it gives Christians this false sense of security because our salvation will protect us from this. I came to expose a silent killer in the church. What is it? Self-murder. Uh, suicide, if you will. Now, I do know that suicide is a, that murder is a sin, but the danger that has been perpetrated upon the church is that if you commit suicide, listen to me, you're going straight to hell. Hmm, watch this. There are places in the Bible where it says God does not hate murder. It's in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit murder. And then there's also places where people committed suicide. So what we have deduced is that if you murder or murderer, even if it's self-murder, you go straight to hell. The problem is with the straight to hell stuff that, you're, that we're telling people about. Now, wait a minute. I'm not going to argue with you about the doctrine of self-murder uh, or, or going to hell. Because that would mean that I would have to get into, you know, election and losing your salvation. And I'd have to get into all of those things about hell. I don't want to get into that because that's not my assignment. I'd have to sit here then and probably go into, are you a Calvinist? Are you an Arminianist? What is your belief? I don't want to deal with all that. That's not my assignment. My assignment, as I said, is to expose this Killer. I'm not talking about heart disease. I'm not talking about diabetes. The killer in the church. Here it is. Here's the lie that messed Christians up. That saints of God don't have to worry about struggling, dealing with, or worrying about mental illness. That somehow we're exempt from mental illness. It's a lie. Here's why it's a lie. Now I do. Here's what we say. We tell the church that uh, because I have the Word of God. I don't have to worry about ever worrying about mental illness or it's the devil and I can catch the devil out. All that is foolishness. You know why? Because it makes us ignorant to the reality that all of us sometime in our life are going to have to deal with that 
spirit of crazy. We're going to have to deal with being overwhelmed by where we are in life. And you know what it's done? It made some saints be unprepared for the struggles they're going through. Look at you sitting out there letting the devil beat you up because you're told the stigma is, I'm not supposed to be able to worry about this. I can cast everything down. I have the Holy Ghost. I, even if you got all that, I don't care how big your anointing, I don't care how much word you know, you still are going to have to wrestle with mental illness. What am I talking about? God would have never said in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus had to give us his peace because he knew there were going to be days when my peace was interrupted. God would have never said to us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he would have never said to us, uh, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Why does God have to tell us we're going to have a sound mind? Because the enemy is going to attack our mind. I'm telling you, don't think that you're off because you're struggling with your mental and emotional parts of your body. Just like your physical body can get sick. Your mind can get sick. The physiologically, uh, a physiology of your brain can change. You can wrestle with some stuff. God would have never said unto us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds in our mind. Uh, when those strongholds come, that we can cast down imagination. Verse 5, what kind of imagination? Imagination, the stuff that's going to run through our mind and try to steal our existence and who we are. Somebody here, you're dealing with mental illness. I'm trying to tell you it's okay. Yes, I believe God's going to make everything all right. I believe things are going to be better. But I also believe we still are going to have to wrestle with these things. What am I saying? Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Most Christians don't realize when you're wrestling with darkness, the favorite place of the enemy is your mind. Sometimes a praise will knock him out. Sometimes a prayer will knock him out. But if you want to be honest, don't get, look, I'm just saying God is telling us you are not exempt from mental problems because you are a Christian. Come on, does somebody here want to be honest with me this morning? How many of us will be honest enough to say we had to wrestle before there were times when the fear and the anxiety and the struggle was too much for us to handle? All we have to do, let, let somebody know, yes, confess up. There were times when it was too much for me to handle. But you know what I did? I did what Peter did in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Here's what Peter said. Peter said, we have been kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation until we are revealed. What God is saying is that because of God's keeping, I wish I had an honest saint that would let somebody know, I know I've been kept. There were days when I was falling apart. There were times when I didn't know how I made it. There were nights when I know the enemy was all up in my mind. But I made it because God kept me. I was overwhelmed, but the Lord did not let me go under. You can identify with Peter. If you can't identify with Peter, go to the psalmist. Psalms 124 verse 1 tells us this, and we all say this scripture. Come on, you might as well say it. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, now let Israel say, all it's saying is that some days when I was anointed, when I just got done shouting, when I know I read my word, but I was under a mental and emotional attack, I could have given up. I could have fell down. But the Lord was on my side. Somebody ought to let somebody know. It was because the Lord was on my side, I did not give up. Because the Lord was on my side, I did smile the next day. Because the Lord was on my side, I don't worry about when the enemy comes to attack my mind. I just hold on to the morning because I know God got me. Come on now. Somebody deal with mental. God told you to turn to this message so you could understand. So what if you're dealing with mental problems? They're going to happen. But God is on your side. And sure enough, we can identify. Not only with the fact that it had not been, David said in Psalms 27, verse 13, I would have fainted if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the 
living, listen to me. David said I would have fainted. it. All he was saying is what Marvin Sapp said in the song. I never would have made it. I need somebody to take a praise break right there and just lift your hand and say, I never would have made Don't be ashamed. Somebody sitting there looking at you, trying to judge you, they're going through the same thing you're going through. Somebody sitting there looking at you, trying to tell you, you must be crazy. Yeah, I was crazy. Yeah, I was all jacked up. But you know what? I got a Savior who knows how to handle jacked up people. Come on. I'm on fire this morning. Somebody better go with me. All I'm telling you is God knows how to handle the struggle. So even if you got to deal with it, you got to understand that we need to own up and deal with mental health struggles. We're going to have them. What I like is, I'm trying to tell somebody to get some help. 2019, three very well-known megachurch pastors preaching the anointed word, leading others to Christ. One pastor had just talked somebody off a ledge, and yet all three killed themselves. I don't have to tell names. I'm just telling you it happens in the church to pastors, to deacons, to just plain. It happens to believers. And all I'm saying is, God said you better be wise enough to know if you need. Go get you some counsel if you need counsel. Go get you some help if you need help. Uh, go get you some medication if you need medication. Come on. Sometimes you need some medication. Pray, but use your medication. Go get you. Go take a break if you got to take a break. But you got to go get some help and quit running away, acting like I can just cast stuff down while the enemy is tearing you down on the inside. Oh, I feel somebody. I'm helping somebody. I feel this this morning. Watch this. All God is telling us in this text, we're going to find out in the, in the book of Romans what it means to, because it's no secret, it's, it's no secret, I'm not switched up on you, right? It's no secret that when my spiritual health gets right, my mind gets right. When my life is lined up with God, there's some joy that comes in instantaneously. All I'm saying is that when my spiritual health is right, I then get divine mental health and physical health, but I'm focusing on the mental this morning. You get divine mental health when you're spiritual. What's divine mental health? It means that when I line myself up with God, when the crazies come, when the struggles come, when the mental pressures come, when my mind is trying to jump out of my body, God said, I will divinely keep you. Let's look at this text. Three things. I want you to write this down. You know how to tell you where I'm going. First thing is you're going to have divine mental health then you have to learn how to give your body a living sacrifice. One of the greatest gifts of God is to be able to give our bodies a living sacrifice. If you're going to learn how to have divine mental health, stay with me, somebody, then you need to learn how to renew your mind, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're going to learn how to have divine mental health, you have to, you have to use your faith. Romans. Hmm. I said earlier at the outset that it is the Magna Carta of uh, theology when it comes to doctrine. It's a book that teaches us how to live a successful and victorious life because this book has every one of the Christian doctrines laid out. Faith, grace, justification, sanctification. Um, it, it tells you how to trust God, righteousness. And it's broken down into the first 11 chapters deal with the doctrines. Yeah, they deal with the doctrines. And the next 12 to 16 deals with practical application. That's where we're starting in the practical application. Read the text. It's practical application. God, God is telling us now, this is how you apply all the stuff that we learned out of Romans. Look at the verse. Verse 1 says this. I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, by the mercy of God, by the mercy of God. One thing that you should take hope in this morning is God has been merciful to you. He said, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, I said, holy and acceptable to God, which 
which is your reasonable service. Whenever something starts, therefore, it means that you should present your body a living sacrifice because of all the stuff that came before chapter 12. God said, I want you to present your body a living sacrifice. If you want to know what the strongest root is for mental health, is to understand what it means to present your body as a living sacrifice. But first, I have to deal with the therefore. Therefore, God is saying, because of all of the blessings that I've been given, you ought to want to give yourself to me. I'll just look at Romans 8. If we just look at Romans 8, and we start at Romans 8, there are so many powerful promises in Romans 8. That's just enough to make you want to sacrifice your life to God. Listen to me. If you go to Romans 8, chapter 14, it says that he has made us able to be children of God. He has made us children of God in verse 14. I love that because when he says he's made us children of God, I got, I, I got to have you understand something. What he has done is he's saying that uh, I got to uh, dispel the myth that everybody's a child of God. No, everybody's not a child of God. To be a child of God is a special place this morning. It's like your child is in a special place because you're their father. Your child can get things from you because they're your child. But John 8, 44, Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. He said, the reason you can't receive my message is because you are of your father. You belong to your father, the devil. So what happens is the devil... It's controlling your life. When you're not a child of God, you're a child of the devil. And when you're a child of God, it's because you have accepted him into your heart. I got some good news for somebody. You accepted him in your heart. The battle is over. All you got to do is hang in there and fight when it's time to fight. But the reality is the victory has already been won if you're a child of God. But if you're a child of the devil, he wants to kill you. He takes you and promises you what you're, you know, you're so blind that you can't even see God's goodness. He promises you the stuff that he does is going to set you free. What does the devil do? He tells you, drink. But don't just drink uh, till you get drunk. Become an alcoholic. He tells you, get high. But don't just smoke blunt. So just, you know, go on to another drug. But get high. And one of the devil's greatest fantasies is when he watches addicts chase after that high. You know what an addict does? An addict chases after that that feeling that he got from the first high, and they try to get higher and higher until they're nowhere. The devil tells you, have sex. Fall in love with this one. Make love to that one. And when the devil tells you that, he's not really saying fall in love. He's saying fall in love. Because when you fall in love, you've given yourself away so much. But you don't even know what sacrificial love is, the kind of love that God is with there. You just start seeing people as images, and the lust in your body steals your ability to love with an agape love from God. He said, go ahead, have sex. Then the devil tells you, live narcissistically. You know you're pretty. You cute. Go, you cute. go ahead, girl. Take what your mama gave you. You can get anybody with that until you find yourself lonely old and lost because you've been in lust instead of but not a child of God. The Bible tells us as a child of God, he that the Son sets free is free indeed. So I'm wrestling, but I'm free. So I'm free to apply God's power onto my mental struggle. He that the Son sets free is free indeed. What am I talking about? When God sets me free, he says, I can come boldly to the throne of grace. No matter what my condition, that's what I need you to see. I don't care how crazy you are. I don't care how bad your life is going. I don't care how many times you've been attacked. God doesn't care about that. God says, but you have the right as his child. Here is the starting point to go boldly to the throne of God. Mess up. Go boldly to the throne of God. Here is our example of going boldly. You know what Peter did? Peter went out and Jesus talked about his sacrifice, and Peter said, you don't have to die. God had to say, get you behind me, Satan. Peter followed Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane, cut off the high priest servant's ear, pulled his knife out. Peter went to the cross and cussed and denied Christ. Peter later went fishing naked. But here's what I want you to see. When Jesus came back, 
He walked out to Peter with all the mess Peter did. He said, feed my sheep. Oh, I want you to understand something. As a child of God, just like you wouldn't turn your child away. Where are the parents at out there? How many know the best child is still my child? And I love them. No matter what they're going through. He said, feed me. How do you are a child of God because you're a child of God? He said, I'll take you back. As a parent, I'll tell you. Wouldn't it be something? The most wayward of our children. It would, it would set our hearts on fire. And they would come back and just say, uh, I'm sorry. I messed up. Can, can you see this? Do you see that's what turns the heart of God? Because you are his child. You go to verse 15 and it says, And we have not been given a spirit of bondage to fear, but we've been given a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He said, we cry out to our Father. That's why I'm telling you, no matter what you're dealing with, you may have to wrestle with anxiety. You may have to wrestle with schizophrenia. You may have to wrestle with bipolar. You may have to wrestle with panic attacks. You may have to wrestle with all kinds of maladies, but it doesn't make a difference. We are fought, we're in a fallen world, in a fallen state, and all kinds of things can attack us, but we have God as our Father. And God's going to make sure you come back. I got good. Come on, somebody, you ought to get your praise right there. You will come back. God has, see what divine mental health is. It means at any moment a miracle can happen that the doctor can't explain. Because you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Verse 17 says, and we become heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything Jesus won on the cross belongs to you. Look at the verse. Verse 17, you are an heir and a joint heir. Me, Jesus won it, I get it. Contentment is mine. Peace belongs to me. Joy belongs to me. God's power belongs to me. Healing belongs to me. All of that is mine because I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm still talking about what he did. Why he used to present your body living sacrifice. Think about what I'm saying. He said, uh, verse 828, all things work together for good. That's why he used to give your body a living sacrifice. 835, that uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 837. Um, um, I'm sorry. We are more than conquerors because of him who loved us. He said, because of all of that, present your body a living sacrifice. Can I help somebody quit giving God dead sacrifices? Dead sacrifices. Somebody got to make you praise God. Somebody got to make you love God. Somebody got to make you pray. But when you start presenting your body as a living sacrifice, it's because you want to. And when you get a case of the want to, watch what God does. See, we got this thing backwards. Many of us feel that um, presenting our that when we serve God or we sacrifice for God, it's what we can get from God. No, real sacrifice comes with what we give to God. When we give God our bodies as a living sacrifice, the blessing that comes is because He knows that I gave Him my body because I want to give Him my body. So when you want to give God your body, there is a difference in uh, sacrifice is a two-way street. Uh, even though uh, the difference is God always starts first. But if we ever got to the point that you start giving giving up something for God, giving back God right now, you want to get free? Give up something for God that you wouldn't give up. It's, it's said that the uh, King Cyrus of Persia captured a prince and his family on one of his, you know, conquering trips. He captured this prince and his family. And the king got him in the front of him, and he got his kids and his wife up there. He said, what would you give me if I let you go free? And the prince said, I will give you half of my kingdom. He said, what would you give me if I let your children go free? He said, all I possess. He said, what would you give me if I let your wife go free? He said, I give you my life. Cyrus was so moved by these people, by this act of sacrifice that he let everyone go. As he was leaving, the prince looked over at his wife and said, wasn't that Cyrus a handsome man? And his wife looked in his eyes with love and said, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't see Cyrus. All I could see was the one who sacrificed everything for me. You know what makes you give God glory? Because God 
sacrifice. You know what I give my body? Because God sacrificed everything for me. You can't seek until you have given to God and watch God beat you giving. Until you have trust God and given up stuff for God, you'll never know the true bliss of having an anointing in your life. So when the mental aberrations come, you can still get through them. Give your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Second point was, holy means set, separate, set apart. If you want to have divine mental health, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There it is, your mind. This is the most important part of this text because our mind must be renewed. Renewed must mean that our mind must constantly be thinking new thoughts, going in a different direction. Because I've given God my body. Now that I've given Him my body, I got to transform my mind. It's a constant renewal. It's when I trust God because of what He did. When you are, when your mind is renewed, it becomes transformed. Form, not conform. You know the reason a lot of things don't have power is because you've been conformed. You're trying to serve God with a worldly mind. You want to stay in church, but you want to also hold on to the world's values. You want to you want to act like I'll sacrifice everything for God, but you want to still be what the world says. So when you try to have the world's value in God, you can't have them both. Conformity is something that it's the natural way my mind wants to go. It's the demonic way my mind wants to go. I, I want to have what everybody else has. I was leaving church one night and it was raining outside. And as I was leaving the church in the rain, I had, my mind was thinking about all the stuff I had to do the next day. And I was going around and you know how your mind is drifting and you, you start thinking and your mind is drifting away. And when I, I, it was dark, so when I got to this certain spot, spot, in the ride, I thought I was at another spot, and so the curve was going this way, but there was a curve in my ride that goes to the right, but then it shoots to the left. So I thought I was on the curve that goes to the right and shoots to the left. I went to shooting to the left, and I was driving into some trees, and I looked up, and I turned back to the right. I looked up, and I found out my mind said I was one place, but the, when I looked up, I found out I was someplace else. Come on, that right there, you got to catch that. God is saying, your mind may be telling you it's over. Your mind may be telling you it's lost. Your mind may be all boggled down. Your circumstance might say there's no way out. All you got to do is look up. God said, and I'll put you back on the right track. Looking up means i got to look up on purpose and make sure that I'm lining up my life with God. I gotta not conform but be transformed by the Spirit of God. Transformation. Transformation is the Greek word of metamorphosis. Metamorphosis means that I change from what I was. A, a, a caterpillar looks like a caterpillar on the outside, but on the inside is a beautiful butterfly. I'm going somewhere. What's on the outside is not what's representative to what God really made you. On the outside, you may look like a caterpillar, but there's a butterfly. Meta, word change, morphosis means that I'm springing out from the inside out. So here's what happens. As you are metamorphosis, as you go into a metamorphosis by the word of God, by presenting your body, by not being conformed, you get transformed by the renewing of your mind, and the real you comes out. I love it. I love it. I love it. I like superhero movies, right? And, and I, I, that's not hard for you to understand about me. I do. I like them all. And I like all of the Marvel movies. I like everything. I like Superman. You know why? Because Superman on the outside looks like Mild Manor Clark Kent. But let, but go out there and mess with Lois Lane. And let him hear in his super hearing Lois saying, Help, Superman! He did me. Or Spider-Man. Spider-Man looks like, uh, you know, little Peter Parker until his spidey sense starts tingling, and then he becomes a wall-crawling fool. Or Batman. Batman looks like Bruce Wayne, just a millionaire, until the bat signal is shot up in the air. And, of course, King T'Challa looks like just one cool black king until you try to invade Wakanda. You're in trouble now. He turns into the black Panther. He turns into something else. All I'm saying, deep on the inside of all of us, we may look like we're just pushovers. I may look like I'm just, you know, another thing. While I'm preaching to you, I may look like, you know, I go through stuff. Yes, I do. I can't handle this. Yes, I can. You know why? Because if you try to mess with my worship, if you 
mess with my praise, if you mess with my time with God, if you mess with what the Lord has done in my life, I will turn into a praising, a praying, a shouting saint that on the inside has the power of God. Where are the people that know there's some supernatural power that comes out of my mouth whenever I think of giving my body to God, who I am in God, and what the real part of me looks like? I change because of the metamorphosis. When you don't change, King Saul is our example. King Saul had mental illness because he forgot God called him. My brothers and sisters, don't you forget. He got low, low self-esteem. He, he started worrying about, you know, he, an evil spirit came to him. Because the Bible said an evil spirit from the Lord. What it means is because he was so disobedient, God couldn't help him. No spiritual health, no divine mental health. Saul is an example. He lost it. He was jealous of David. He starts fearing everybody. He disobeyed God again. And then finally, oh, first he was schizophrenic. One day he loved David. The next day he wanted to kill David. Finally, he went to see the witch of Endor. Uh, First Samuel chapter thirty-one, verse four says, and he asked when the when he was losing the battle. Hmm, I can't stay here. Don't you dare quit because it looks like you're losing the battle. Saul forgot my little example about not knowing where he really was. But he had disobeyed God so much he had let his spiritual alignment with God go. Some of y'all just like it. You're not close to God. You, you, you know, come on, you know your spiritual health isn't right. When your spiritual health isn't right, your mental health suffers. Saul looked at his armor bearer and said, kill me before my enemies come. His armor bearer said, no. The Bible says Saul fell on his sword. Because Saul was not transformed. He had the name Christian. He was saved. I don't know if he was saved, but he was trying to follow God, but he wasn't transformed. Some of you, your problem is you haven't transformed. You haven't let the real you that God put the destiny and the purpose of God that's in you come out to fight your battle. You gotta be transformed. Daniel, all you had to do not to go into the lion's den was to quit praying to God and close his window. But he wouldn't conform. When he wouldn't conform, not only did the lions not eat him, but he was promoted. Terah, Meshach, and Abednego, all they had to do was bow down. They never would defy him. They wouldn't conform. They were transformed. They said, no, God will save us. The, the prodigal son, I love this one. The prodigal son, all he had to do, he was down the pig pen. He knew he had told his dad off. He had squandered. But you know what? He was down that pig pen. He could have just said, I'm poor like everybody else. Some of you out there are professing something that's coming to reality because you won't do like he said. Prodigal son said, no, I came to myself. I got a father. When you're not transformed, transformed people think God's going to make a way out. Transformed people think it's not over. I'm talking to somebody. Transformed people think this is just the beginning. Transformed people said, if I get knocked down, I'll get back up. Transformed people say, I got a sickness, but God can heal me. Transformed people say, and whatever God does, I know it's going to be for my good. Not only must you learn to give your body a living sacrifice for good mental health, not only must you learn to be transformed. Let's close this up with the last part. And it says in here, that you must learn. For I say unto you, verse 3, through the grace given unto me, to every man, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. There's the problem. Think soberly. For God has given to each man the measure of faith. Please listen to this. God is saying, don't think that you can handle it. Don't think of yourself more than you ought. But be sober and think, I need my faith. Then go further. Not only do I need my faith, I know that God has given me the measure of faith. That's good stuff there. The measure of faith is God knew this situation was going to happen. And I'm telling you right now, I'm proclaiming, I'm prophetically professing in your life. You have the faith to get out, but you got to use your faith. Listen to the text. 
Quit worrying about what somebody else's faith says. Quit worrying about what's going on. Use the faith, God said. He said, because I've given you the measure. He measured the faith you would need to get through this situation. He measured it. So you can get out of any situation as long as you can be transformed. Listen. Yep, I had to deal with anxiety. You need some medication. So what? Use your faith. God will bless you through. I need to go to counseling. Use your faith to get to the counseling. What am I telling you? Quit worrying about the others. Use counseling, get the medication, use everything. But here's something you will never run out of. You may run out of medication. The therapy sessions may not work. The counseling may not work. But you know what will always work? If I keep lining my God, my life up with God. Strong spiritual health. Listen to me. Can bring divine mental health. God will come in. Bring the nick of time. Somebody ought to get on your knees right now. Say, Lord, I need to line my life back up. Once you line your life back up and your spiritual health, serve God, give God, be out there making sure that everything God has is a priority in my life. When the priorities in your life happen, all of a sudden you'll find yourself mentally walking through all your struggles. Yep, God got some jacked up people out there. Sometimes you and me are one of them. But you know what's great? If I keep my mental, my spiritual health strong, connected, present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is just my reasonable strength. If I do that, not be so conformed, but transformed by renewing my mind over and over again by the Word of God. I don't care what mental attack comes. I'm not saying you won't have to deal with it, but it sure won't win because you'll have God's divine power. Bitterness of soul. Made a promise to God. Child came. That's a lie. He said, Oh Lord, take my life. Right after he fought the prophets of Baal, God took him into a cave and fed him and nourished him back to health and sent him back out. Trust God. And you will have strong spiritual health leads to strong mental. Don't you fall apart next time you think crazy coming. Turn it over to your spiritual walk. This Pastor Duncan Singh will see you on Wednesday night in the middle of a powerful series on Wednesday night. And I need you to tune in and make sure you're there. We're talking about the keys to, uh, when, you, when you talk about deliverance, the keys for your breakthrough. So just tune in and get the second half of that message. God bless you. Please go to our website, Shallow Baptist Churches. Uh, Shallow Baptist, www.shallowbaptistchurches.org. Go to our Facebook. Please, please, please go and subscribe to our YouTube. Everyone, SBC Praise Church or Shallow Baptist 2. To our YouTube and to our Instagram channel. This Pastor Duff is saying, God bless you and may the power of God. Next time you get into trouble, remember, as long as I'm strong spiritually, I can handle anything. Tell me, leave it there. I was down with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus. Will set you free.